Welcome back everyone to another reaction video. Well, if you are a long time follower of this channel, you may remember that some of the very first reaction videos I ever did were to the band Sabaton. In fact, my very first Sabaton reaction was to the song Bismarck. And at that point I had never heard Sabaton before, which makes me sad looking back because I missed out on so much great music over the years. They are by far my favorite band today. Uh, if you're not familiar with them, uh, all of their songs, uh, they're a Swedish metal band. All their songs have to do with history, primarily military history. Uh, not to glorify a war, but they tell stories. And I've learned a lot of stories I did not otherwise know. And they have this series called Sabaton History, where they give the history behind some of their songs. Hosted by Indy Nidell, who is a friend of this channel, who subscribes to this channel. I'm proud to say, because he's absolutely one of my favorite historians. He's such a fantastic storyteller. I have learned a lot from him and how he presents a story. So we're going to dive into one of Sabaton's latest songs. My youngest son, Eli, would tell you this is his one of his absolute favorites. It's called Father, and it's about Fritz Haber, who uh, is considered to be the father of chemical warfare during World War I. But he is also known for some incredible civilian breakthroughs. So we're going to dive into the history of this. I'll put the link in the description, as well as the links to a bunch of my other Sabaton reactions, Sabaton history reactions. Let's go ahead and dive into this one. Hi there, I'm Pat from Sabaton. And I'm Indy Nidell. He's the bass and player. And today here on Sabaton History Channel, we are premiering a brand new song. You are hearing it here for the first time. Father. Such a good song. Oh, it's so good. Not every legacy is easily distinguishable as good or evil. Sometimes it's more like the light of a candle. The brighter it shines, the longer it casts its shadow. And this goes to a point that I make all the time, and you've probably heard me say it more than you ever care to hear anybody say anything, but history is complicated. It's nuanced. We so often try to paint history as black and white. There's good guys and bad guys. There's positive and there's negative. And the fact is that most things are gray areas. Even some of our greatest historical heroes have very complicated and sometimes ugly parts to their story. Uh, and this guy's no different. The master chemist Fritz Haber's accomplishments have lifted humanity up as a whole, helping billions of people, yet also caused terrible, agonizing deaths and lifelong suffering for hundreds of thousands of others. It is a legacy seemingly caught between ethics and science, between idolization and condemnation, between home and exile, yet also true to his own credo, in peace for mankind, in war for the, for the fatherland. fatherland. Yeah. And in Sabaton's song, they say, during times when there's peace, he belongs to the world. During times when there's war, he belonged to his place of birth. And that really sums it up, that during peacetime, his scientific discoveries did have a positive impact on the whole world. But when it came down to the time for war, he sided with his country. The Nobel Prize Committee of the Swedish Royal Academy announced its honorees for the years 1914 to 1919, the war years. Five of those honored were Germans, and among them was Fritz Haber. He was awarded the 1918 Nobel Prize for Chemistry for the groundbreaking achievement of creating synthetic ammonia. Yet, there was a loud roar of outrage by mm. French and British scientists who sent in notes of protest. Haber, they said, was the father of chemical warfare. And yeah, he was that too. Fritz Haber was born in Breslau, Prussia in... A that is... And I think I just mentioned this in another video the other day. This is the, the hometown of Manfred von Richthofen, the, the Red Baron. It's now actually part of Poland, but at the time it was part of uh, Prussia. 1868. His father was a wealthy Jewish businessman who supported early on his son's interest in chemical experiments. Hunger studied organic chemistry and physics at the university in Berlin. Interesting that his father is Jewish. Uh, so Fritz Haber in another generation wouldn't have been welcome in his own country where he graduated cum laude in 1891 and reached full professor of physical chemistry in 1906. Already then, he was making great strides with his intellect and drive while boasting that he had never attended a single lecture on physical chemistry 
except for his own. <laughs> but he had yet to find his niche. From gas phase chemistry to electrochemistry, his interests were not limited to a single field of research. Talking about him not finding his niche right away, that's there's an important life lesson in that. And I, I, Listen, I don't pretend to be like some life coach or have any great answers or a ton of wisdom, but um, I think there's so many things that we can learn in our personal lives from history sometimes. And in some cases, people who have these incredible lasting impacts on the world, they don't even discover who they want to be or really kind of start to find their their fit until very late in life. This would change when he was confronted with what was considered a classic problem, the Malthusian trap, which holds that growth on our planet had a limit since people multiply exponentially and resources arithmetically, and that the Earth's soil could only feed and sustain a certain number of people. Chemistry and the production of potent fertilizers challenged the Malthusian nightmare. But the question of how to artificially replenish agricultural soil with nitrogen that in turn could be metabolized by plants remained unsolved. So great point here. Um, you know, we talk about the Industrial Revolution all the time, but at the same time the Industrial Revolution was going on, there was also an Agricultural Revolution that was going on. Incredible advancements in uh, farming equipment and processes that vastly multiplied the effectiveness of an acre of ground. And one of the challenges, and I don't understand a lot about farming and stuff like that, but I know kind of basically that you have to rotate crops. Right here uh, in Northeast Ohio, where I live, the, the places that have farms very often rotate between corn and soybeans because different crops take nutrients out of the soil that they need in order to grow. And so at some point you have to somehow replenish those nutrients by planting a different kind of crop that uses something different and maybe deposit something different. Or you have to fertilize it by artificially offering those nutrients into the soil. And this is what is going to be solved by Fritz Haber. For the ambitious Haber, this problem presented the perfect opportunity to leave his mark on the scientific world. The scientists before him had provided theories that the fixation of hydrogen and nitrogen out of the air was indeed possible, yet no one had found the correct amount of pressure, heat, and the right catalyst to do so. Without going into detail, it would be Fritz Haber who finally succeeded where others had failed. Through correct calculations and by adding an osmium catalyst, he achieved the desired gaseous reaction and brought about the equilibrium constant. Eureka! There was ammonia! In cooperation with Carl Bosch, who'd go on to replace the osmium with an iron catalyst and the industrial capacities of BASF, synthetic ammonia would soon be in full production. What is known as the Haber-Bosch process would literally change life on Earth. Yep as it made today's population numbers possible. So billions of people can thank Fritz Haber. Even at the time, his discovery elevated Haber to the top of the pops in Germany and beyond. There's so many inventions in history that are revolutionary and that have lasting, just incalculable impacts on the world by people we've never even heard of. You know, we like the sexy inventions like the automobile and the airplane and the motion pictures and the light bulb. And we love to talk about that stuff, but stuff like the Haber Bosch process are so much more important than those things. Yeah. They, those other things allow us to have more fruitful lives and enjoyable lives, but this literally made more life possible because up until this time, a lot of people are dying uh, very early and, and you're going to start to see the population skyrocket in the 20th century in a large part because now we can feed people better and people don't starve as often. And in 1911, as a group of prominent scientists from the Prussian Academy were thinking of creating an institute for the elite of Germany's intellectuals, it was Haber who was proposed as one of its directors. Hmm. As the head of the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute for Physical Chemistry and Electrochemistry, Haber would have the first heyday of his career, and science in Germany thrived like it never had before. Like all good things, though, the era of scientific prosperity came to an end. 
but quickly. The outbreak of the Great War not only put an end to nearly all research that was not vital to the war effort, but it also shattered the previously well-knit international academic mm. community. What was once for the sake of all mankind, leading their research according to principles of the République des Lettres, was now stifled by the demands of warring nations. And scientists were drafted into the chemists' war to build the deadliest weapons of their time. Fritz Haber's research into ammonia was almost immediately of importance for the German war machine. The Kaiser and his generals had planned for a very short war, and German explosives and the propellant industry relied on saltpeter nitrate imports from Chile, which was now blocked off. That problem was overcome by Haber, who was now hailed for creating gunpowder from the air. But this was only the beginning of his involvement in the war. In the early morning hours of April 22, 1915, Eeper. a greenish-yellow fog up to two meters high crept towards the Allied lines. It was driven by the wind, and those who smelt it described its sweetish chloric smell, which was also irritating like pepper. But those who did so were also soon seen coughing, spitting, and retching. So this attack that happens April 22, 1915, uh, on the north side of the Ypres salient, it primarily hits, I think it's Algerian and Canadian troops, um, puts this like four, four mile wide hole in the line. And it was so much more effective than the Germans expected it to be that they didn't exploit the breakthrough. And it could have been a turning point in the war. It was that important. Uh, but some heroism by some Canadian troops, as well as lack of understanding of what would happen here, really makes all the difference. But this chlorine gas, the Germans can make this in abundance. You know, they're blockaded, but chlorine was actually a byproduct of their industry that they had in Germany. And so they had chlorine, the ability to make chlorine gas in abundance. Um, but chlorine gas could be countered by wearing a, 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 the right kind of gas mask because it didn't do anything really to the skin. But it's heavier than air, so it kind of sticks low to the ground. So you couldn't get down low underneath it like you could with smoke or something. And it would just kind of creep in that direction. And um, it, it changes everything. Caught in the fog, men clutch their throats, their eyes red with pain, stumbling around in terror. Many simply collapsed to the ground, gasping for air. The Germans had unleashed 160 tons of Haber's newest invention, chlorine gas. As a weapon, the gas attacked the mucous membranes and the wet tissues of lungs, eyes, and throat. This was the advent of modern chemical warfare. No one was quite aware of what kind of Pandora's box had been opened. For Fritz Haber personally, the day was both triumph and tragedy. The German military called Haber a national hero and symbolically promoted him to Hauptmann. His Captain. marriage, however, was reaching its darkest point. Like her husband, Clara Haber, aspired to leave her mark on the scientific world. She was even the first woman to get a doctorate in chemistry at the University of Breslau, with her thesis on the solubility of heavy metal salts. Heavy metal. Yet, unlike her husband, this did not open the doors of yeah. the academic world to her. Although her colleagues were generally supportive, this was not a time when women often found employment in fields like, like physics or chemistry. Clara worked as a freelancer, but was frustrated. Interesting that she's from Breslau, which is in modern Poland, because Marie Curie, who is probably one of the most famous female scientists of all time, if not the most famous, comes from that same area. ...over her expected role as a housewife, mother, and hostess to the prominent guests of her husband, tired and depressed by an unfulfilled life and a dysfunctional marriage, Clara took her own life. Yeah. On the day when Fritz Haber was hailed a hero by the press, she was found dead by their 13-year-old son. Mm. Haber's thoughts about her death remain unknown, and contrary to a lot of public opinion, there is no evidence that Clara's suicide was caused by her husband's involvement in chemical warfare. 
Either way, Haber left for the Eastern Front the next day to instruct German pioneers on how to deploy his new weapon. Gas would become one of the most feared weapons of the whole Great War. But although many of Haber's colleagues spoke out against its introduction, calling it a perversion of science and fundamentally abhorrent, it was not universally condemned. So one thing to point out is there had been international treaties that had been signed outlawing the use of chemical warfare. Uh, but I, I might be wrong on this. I might want to look it up. But I believe that it, spe it specified using it in artillery shells. And so the way that the Germans kind of felt they were getting around that was that basically this attack that happens at Ypres in April 1915 is they have all these tanks, uh, tanks of gas, uh, and they just open the valves and just kind of let it come out and blow across no man's land into uh, the French and uh, British Commonwealth lines. So they kind of felt like, well, we're not launching it in artillery shells, so it's really not technically a violation of the treaty. But eventually it would be used in artillery shells as well. In fact, far from it, the Entente was quick to retaliate, yep. of course, turning gas warfare against German soldiers as well. Haber argued that he wanted to primarily break the psychological will of Germany's enemies, much like with the frightening effect of a flamethrower or a... And that's important to note because I believe the numbers are somewhere in the tens of thousands that, that were killed by gas throughout the entire war. And when you're talking about a war that took upwards of 20 million lives, it's a pretty tiny percentage. The real effect of gas was in injuries and in psychological impact. Like he said at the beginning, there are hundreds of thousands who were impacted either with some damage that was done to their body, especially by mustard gas, which would stick to everything and would affect the, any uh, exposed parts of skin. It would even get into your clothes and it could impact people later on. Um, and just the, the mental impact that this had, much like artillery did. Bayonet charge. Once the stalemate on the fronts was broken, it would save so many others from the machine guns and artillery shells of a prolonged war. Until the end of the war, the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute would continue to produce other chemical agents, most notably phosgene gas and Ypperite, also known as mustard gas. Haber introduced the concept of Bundschissen, where, where different kinds of gas shells were deployed uh, in an effort to act as, as mask breakers, right? Like one kind of gas would penetrate the filters, forcing the affected soldier to take off his mask, only to then be hit by an asphyxiating gas shell the next moment. Yet poison gas ultimately did not shorten the war. Yeah. Instead, it's estimated that by the war's end, around 1.3 million soldiers were wounded by the effects of chemical weapons, many blinded or with lungs destroyed, many of them killed by asphyxiation or internal bleeding. Horrible stuff, horrible. The armistice saw the Entente publish a list of around 900 alleged war criminals they wanted to bring to trial. Haber, as the father of chemical warfare, was among the most wanted. The Hauptmann quickly got out of his uniform and fled to Switzerland. But the charges against him were soon dropped and returned to his institute in Berlin. In 1920, he was awarded the Nobel Prize for his... I was going to say, that's uh, Einstein on the left over here, and I I think that's Marie Curie. I could be wrong, but I think it is. His ammonia synthesis. At the ceremony, no one mentioned his involvement in trying to keep the German war machine afloat, nor how his inventions gave birth to modern gas warfare. Many in Europe's scientific community simply wanted to return to how it was before the war. Haber never showed any signs of remorse. Instead, he turned his full attention to the prosperity of his institute. Under the Great Harbor, it would attract many world-class scientists and, and promote new ways of scientific thinking, from embryonic quantum mechanics to gas kinetic studies to the transfer of energy between atoms. There were many branches of science mm. at work here. One somewhat funny project called Gold from Seawater was aimed at combating the Republic's growing debt by extracting gold from the oceans. 
Okay, although based on a huge miscalculation and soon abandoned, the idea showed how how open-minded the Institute was to unconventional ideas. Yeah. Supported by prominent sponsors from the industry, Haber would enjoy another heyday, which also came to its end. When the Nazis rose to power in 1933, they soon extended their clutches to Germany's scientific world. Although Fritz Haber had converted to Protestantism when uh. he was 25, he was still a persona non grata to the new state. Hitler personally hated the Jew Haber, who openly supported the democratic principles of the Republic. See, this is a great point, too. And this is something I didn't really fully understand until about 15 years ago. I think it was around 15 years ago. I got to visit the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. And they had a whole display on the genetics that was involved with who they determined to be a Jew and, and not. And and like how many grandparents there had to be and which grandparents there had to be and all this stuff. And so it didn't matter what his religion was. He was still considered by them ethnic, ethnically to be a Jew. Yet Haber was too well established to be attacked publicly. Instead, they pressured him with new laws, demanding the Institute fire all scientists of Jewish ancestry. Haber, who believed that science and academia stood above such differences, mm. could not accept this. Good for him. Instead, put in his own resignation letter. Then he was basically banished from the fatherland he had worked tirelessly to save and improve. At first he went to Cambridge University, then toyed with the idea of moving to Palestine. But he could not bring himself to fully break with his German identity. Haber died in Switzerland on January 29, 1934, from a heart attack. To this day, Fritz Haber's legacy remains controversial, at least historically. From a purely scientific viewpoint, his accomplishments in the world of chemistry were indisputably the works of one of the greatest. The benefits of the Haber-Bosch process are enjoyed every day yeah. around the globe. True. But the legacy of the horrors of gas warfare remains a dark shadow over Haber's and mankind's history. So yeah, I mean, like I said at the beginning, that's true for pretty much any historical figure. You look at any historical figure and you've got to say, you know what, their legacy is complicated, right? We just did a couple of videos on Abraham Lincoln, and Abraham Lincoln is viewed by most people as one of our great presidents. He He's instrumental in what eventually leads to the abolition of slavery with the 13th Amendment, but he also did some pretty tyrannical type things by arresting people who spoke out against his government. And, uh, you know, you could say that about pretty much every character uh, that has existed in, in our own lives as well. So Fritz Haber is no different than that. And the, the rest of the video, um, they're going to talk about the history of the song and, and how they went about writing the song, what the song's about. So I, I've put a link in the description. If you want to check out the original content, you can see what all they have to say about the song. I'm not going to do reaction to that part. I just wanted to focus on the history uh, part of it, uh, of Fritz Haber's story. So like I said, I'll throw up some links on the screen as well as down in the description so you can learn more about some of the things that Sabaton has covered over time. Thanks for watching.